Thank you. I hate to disrupt all this wonderful conversation, but we, we, want, we need to get started with our program, so thank you. Uh, I'm Diana Ramsey, and I'm the president of the American Occupational Therapy Foundation, and it's my pleasure to be able to welcome you to the Foundation's 2013 Breakfast with a Scholar. We have now enjoyed 19 years of thought-provoking and relevant ideas brought about from other disciplines to enrich and broaden the understanding of occupation through this elegant gathering. And this year promises to be just as inspiring. We are deeply honored to have retired Rear Admiral Marty Evans with us today. We're also honored by the generous support of our Breakfast with a Scholar sponsors, Donald Lang and the Amerigroup Foundation, and by all of you, our esteemed colleagues and cherished friends, for your support and participation in this and other programs and events of the Foundation. I'd like to draw your attention to the posters around the room which have been created by active duty occupational therapists here in California to help us in our salute of the role of occupational therapy in the military. Descriptions of each poster are listed in your program and I invite you to join me in thanking the talented occupational therapists who created them. Those occupational therapists are Jason Jensen, John Rose, Christine Haynes, Lisa Meserly, Joseph Kidd, and Melissa Park. So let's join together again. Thank you. For nearly 50 years, the foundation has been dedicated to supporting research, education, public awareness, and leadership development in occupational therapy. We're so pleased to announce to you now that the American Occupational Therapy Foundation and the American Occupational Therapy Association have partnered to advance the centennial vision by establishing grants for intervention research in autism spectrum disorders and health problems related to aging. Please join us in helping to fund these important research grants and make your tax-deductible gift to AOTF today. It's very easy. It's particularly easy probably if you're under the age of... <laughs> we, we have all this Twitter stuff going on, so... <laughs> um, you can text, but you can text AOTF to 80888 to give a $10 donation or scan the code on your program to make a gift online. Of course, if you make a gift online, you can make it for more than $10. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in this important work. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the moderator of today's program, Mary Everett. Mary Everett is a management consultant who facilitates organizational strategic change and provides executive coaching customized workshops, and keynoting to enhance leadership of visionary executives and assist customer-oriented organizations in planning, evaluating, and implementing strategic change. She is a passionate advocate for helping OTs and the public understand the key roles OTs can and do play in emergency disaster preparedness, response, and rehabilitation. Her impressive career has included academic roles, government service in community and public health, and as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health in the Public Health Service, she worked with the Office of the late Surgeon General Everett Koop. Mary is a past president and award of merit recipient of the American Occupational Therapy Association and has distinguished herself through many important volunteer leadership roles serving occupational therapy in California. And thanks to her friendship with both the foundation and our featured speaker, we are privileged to present our exciting program to you today. 
Please join me in welcoming the moder moderator of the 19th Annual Breakfast with a Scholar. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Mary Everett. Good morning. Is that loud enough? Welcome to paradise. And we are just so pleased that so many of you have come to San Diego. It's been a long dry spell. The last time you all were here was 1978, and I think I was 21 then. <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> Those are my friends. So I, what I'd like to start with is that uh, we've had one heck of a week. Um, you know, I, I feel like the magnet for disaster queen here because as this topic has approached, we've had so many circumstances around the world and in our own country that have just given us great pause. But what I'd like to do today is recognize the many men and women who serve our nation who are with us today. And in remembering the sacrifices of our wounded warriors and of our patriots who made the ultimate sacrifice uh, for their country. Will all the active duty and retired military in the audience please stand so we can all thank you with our applause. Thank you very much. Today we have a very distinguished uh, warrior and civilian patriot as our speaker. A woman I met when we were stationed uh, at the Naval Academy in the mid-80s. Uh, living next door to our family, she was the first woman to be a battalion commander at the Navy. My husband was also a battalion commander, so that's why our homes were right next to one another. And at that time, I was just entering the Reagan administration as a senior executive at the Department of Health and Human Services. So we were both entering exciting, unchartered waters when our friendship began. It gives me great pleasure today to be able to introduce my esteemed friend, Rear Admiral Marty Evans. Making a difference and forging new ground exemplifies the lifelong commitment um, of this nationally admired leader in the military, and in premier, she's also been a leader in premier nonprofit organizations. Since that tragic date in history, September 11th, 2001, I have hoped that we could uh, spotlight Marty's amazing career at our convention. Today, we will hear her insights and wisdom gained from um, leadership during national, state, and local emergencies and disasters, and from the lessons learned from the military at war. The aspiration has come true today, and I am thrilled to be able to tell you a little bit about why she was chosen by the foundation to be our scholar uh, at this annual breakfast. Uh, she was worried about the scholar part. I told her, we've had a ballerina. You certainly qualify. And boy, she gave a great speech, too, that ballerina did. As part of the elite Navy female leadership, Marty has held a number of command positions uh, overseeing multi-million dollar budgets and thousands of employees. She was the chief of staff at the Naval Academy in Annapolis and the first woman to command a US Naval station at Treasure Island in the San Francisco Bay Area. There happened to be a, a big earthquake up there when she was in command. She held the top position at the Navy uh, Recruiting Command when she managed 6,000 uh, 6, employees in 1,200 locations and recruited more than 70,000 officers and sailors annually, including Navy OTs. There were about five or six of them at that time. I did go to her office and tell her about Navy OTs. Her final tour of duty, I think, was a superintendent uh, or president of the Naval Postgraduate School up here in Monterey, California, and she retired in 1998 as Rear Admiral. Well, that's when the fun began. Uh, you, you can imagine um, how attractive this type of a woman who had the background she did would be to corporations and associations. So in January 1998, she assumed the leadership of the Girl Scouts of the uh, United States of America, where she revolutionized the 90-year-old organization and um, modernized its vision and programs uh, for its nearly 3 million young members. 
Under her leadership, the Girl Scouts created uh, cutting edge programs in science, technology, sports, money management, and community service. Throughout Evans's tenure as a girl, the Girl Scouts reached an unprecedented level of diversity as African American, Asian, and Hispanic girls uh, discovered the organization. From 2002 to 2005, she was uh, president and CEO at the American Red Cross. This was right after 9-11. And their annual operating budget was over $4 billion. Uh, the Red Cross assists millions of Americans each year by providing urgent aid to its victims of disasters, teaching safety requirements and preparedness and life-saving skills, and collecting, processing, and distributing nearly half of the nation's blood supply. Uh, they also assist um, military members and their families uh, when there are problems that need to put together uh, the people involved in that, either through communication or visits. The Red Cross provides help and hope to victims of disasters and diseases in more than 30 countries around the world, in addition to the United States. In 2005, Red Cross volunteers and staff assisted the victims of more than 70,000 natural and human resources, natural caused disasters, from single family home fires to large scale events. I had no idea it, they were that busy, but that's pretty impressive. Uh, that means they're everywhere, these little things that we don't even hear about in our neighborhood and our environment. This included a response to, the, uh, to extraordinary humanitarian emergencies, including uh, hurricane, hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wilma, and the devastating 2004 December two tsunamis in South Asia. So they've made major progress in, uh, also they made major progress in eradicating uh, measles in Africa. For her leadership the, of the Red Cross response, uh, nonprofit Times named her the executive of the year in 2005. Additionally, Marty led the Red Cross in implementing a bold new initiative, Together We Prepare. With five simple steps, you make a plan, you build a disaster kit, you get trained, you give blood, and you volunteer. People in the communities prepared themselves, their families, schools, businesses, and neighborhoods for the unexpected that might happen in their immediate environment. Yeah, right. Um, it's hard. That light is blinding me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm getting the glare off my glasses, too. And my hearing aids are working, so that's, we're all good. <laughs> so to me, together we prepare. It could be routinely used by our profession as an additional, simple, ordinary daily life activity that we discuss and operationalize with all of our patients, clients, and families and uh, before they get discharged from, the, from whatever um, occupational therapy program they're in. For the second half of 2009, Evans was appointed the acting commissioner of the Ladies Professional Golf Association. She doesn't let any grass grow between her toes. And uh, many of you know this as the premier women's uh, golf association in the world. She is in demand to speak on leadership and also uh, the director of the following organizations, who she's busy with by conference call this afternoon, some of them anyway, Office Depot, Weight Watchers International, the North Highland Company, and the First Tee. Over her career, Marty's been honored with many awards, including eight honorary de uh, degrees. In the late 70s, she was a White House Fellow. And that association of White House Fellows then awarded her the 2002 John W. Gardner Legacy of Leadership Award. And in 2005, she was given the Four Freedoms Award by the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Found, uh, Institute. She hails from Springfield, Illinois and graduated from Occidental College with a degree in Diplomacy and World Affairs. Her master's degree in Law and Diplomacy is from Tufts University Fletcher School. She's an avid sportswoman. I don't know what sport she doesn't tackle, and uh, is a triathlete, and uh, lives with her husband, Jerry, in uh, Pont Vedra Beach, Florida. Her questions to us are, how will the future be different? And what can we learn from our past failures of imagination 
and she will challenge us this morning with these questions. After her remarks, she will emerge in a conversation, engage in a conversation to inspire us to imagine the opportunities for our profession and to act upon them. Admiral Evans, may I present to you my dear colleagues, the colleagues in the profession of occupational therapy. Well, good morning. That is a bright light. Um, it, is, it is an honor to be here with you today. And I, I just have to say, I'm, I'm so glad I am up here because I was beginning to think it was an obituary you were reading. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful to come back to San Diego. Um, I've always said, I always said in the Navy that uh, my best duty station was the one I was currently at. Um, but I have to tell you, the really best duty station I ever had was here in San Diego in 1982 to 84 uh, at recruit training in uh, NTC, and I'm so sad that it doesn't exist anymore. Well, when I retired from uh, full-time work, uh, somebody asked me at the retirement event, somebody asked me, uh, so, so Marty, what are you going to do now? And, you know, I just kind of, without doing any kind of uh, intellectual filter, I just popped off with, well, I'm only going to do things that bring me great joy. Well, as I've reflected now how many years since uh, 2005, as I've reflected on, uh, you know, maybe that was exactly what I intended to, to do, only to do things that bring me great joy. And to come out here to San Diego and be with Mary, catch up with Mary and Dick, um, who are First of all, wonderful neighbors, great colleague when we were at the Naval Academy, and, and such great friends over the years. Um, that certainly qualifies and, and meets the test of, of, cert, of something that brings me great joy. It's also a little bit of a payback. Now, um, I, I've known for all, you know, many years, decades now, that uh, Mary was uh, an occupational therapist. And of course, I knew that she was um, highly esteemed in the profession. And it is true, when I was the head Navy recruiter, she did visit me. Now, we had 70,000 recruits a year, officers and enlisted. Uh, the five OTs were important to us, but I have to say on the relative scale of things, that the good news was we didn't have to work terribly hard to find those five OTs. <clears throat> that was um, one, one category of recruitment <coughs> that I truly did not lose any sleep. But, when I say it's a payback, <clears throat> it's uh, a payback because of a very recent experience I had. Um, back in uh, February of 2012, actually in January of 2012, I received an invitation to play Augusta. Now, how many of you are golfers? How many of you have heard of the Masters? You know that it's played at the uh, Augusta National Golf Course. And you may know that uh, certainly at that point women were not members. Uh, but uh, women could be invited to play, and so I had received a truly coveted invitation. That was January of, of 2012. In February of 2012, I went skiing, and I fell once the entire week, but I managed to get myself a gamekeeper's thumb in the fall. Yeah, and you all know, you know, I had the ski pole and mashed my hand and so on. And when I went back home, I'm trying to hold my golf club, and I'm realizing I'm having a little bit of trouble. And finally, after a couple weeks, I decided to go see my uh, sports medicine doctor. And uh, she said, well, it looks like surgery. And I'm thinking, no surgery for me. I'm playing Augusta. There's no way I'm going to not play Augusta. So she said, well, you know, there's one possibility. Let's, why don't we work? Why don't I send you to an OT? I said, OT, wow, I've heard of OTs. So, but, but I really had no idea what OTs did, frankly. So she sent me to see James Braxton, and I hope uh, maybe he's here at the convention, uh, at the Mayo Clinic. And he made me a finger hand cast. And it was, it was really cute, it was pink, and it had little Velcro strips so I could actually take it off, wash it in the dishwasher, and so on. But the point is, I did exactly what he said. He was, he, 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 he was perfect. I mean, he, 
educated me on why it was important. He made this fabulous hand cast for me. He uh, made sure I understood, and you know, he did the checklist, how do you learn? He, he did all of that. It was textbook perfect. And you know what? Eight weeks later, took the cast off, and nine weeks after that, I went and played Augusta. So, I certainly thanked him at the time, but I also think that sometimes you pay it forward. And um, so, uh, coming here today gives me a chance to thank all of you for what you do on a daily basis, um, not just for people who have serious injuries, serious issues, but who have quality of life issues. And I tell you, not being able to play Augusta would have been a huge quality life impact for me. <laughs> well, my theme today is uh, how can we make the future different? And what I thought I'd talk about was how seriously flawed our planning for disasters and for the reintegration of wounded warriors in our communities has been. And in both instances, and I'm try to figure out how these tie together. And I think there's a very direct relationship in that our serious issues with both of these categories has to do with our failure of imagination. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think today, and this week in particular, it, uh, the events both in Texas and in, in Massachusetts bring home again the fact that uh, if we fail to imagine, thank you so much, if we fail to imagine what might happen, then it's, it's very hard and we're put in a position where we have to react. We've been poorly prepared in many, so many instances, and as a result, great losses have been suffered. In the case of battlefield trauma, going into our decade-long war, we didn't grasp or appreciate the challenges that lay ahead of caring for the nation's wounded and supporting their families uh, and the uh, great impact and the, uh, the burden on the caregivers. In both disaster and wartime planning, our imaginations failed us, and now we mourn our losses and we have to play catch up to provide care and support. We failed to imagine the scale and scope of natural and man-made disasters and their effects, particularly on vulnerable populations. Now consider, in 2004, if you remember back, uh, 2004 was, by all records and all the record keeping, 2004 was a historic hurricane season. We had one after another that went through Florida, the south, uh, southeast, across Texas. After the 2004 season, in, in that late, win uh, late fall, winter, we challenged ourselves at the Red Cross to imagine a hurricane season that was four or five times the scale and scope of the 2004 hurricanes, uh, hurricanes. And we made some pretty significant changes, particularly in our disaster volunteer programs, in our training. We launched a major campaign, as Mary described, the Five Points uh, campaign. Well, in truth, we failed to imagine what we ended up facing in 2005. A season, a hurricane season that would be 20 times, 20 times larger in terms of the impact, in terms of the destruction, just the geography of the destruction, in terms of the number of uh, people, a number of families who suffered uh, devastating losses and needed very significant long-term care. The Red Cross and the other disaster response organizations, including federal government, state, and local government at all levels, did not foresee a U.S. city needing 100% evacuation as happened in New Orleans. We also failed, I mean, you, you'd think after 2005 that we learned something, and I think we did, but we failed to imagine the kind of impact that then we saw with Hurricane Sandy. And when I think about hurricane, it was, I guess, rechristened Superstorm Sandy. That doesn't even begin to capture the extraordinary impact that Hurricane Sandy had and continues to have. Well, adults 65 and older are consistently the least prepared of any subgroup of the population 
according to Lisa Brown, who's a psychologist at the University of Florida. She convenes the Gerontological Society of America Working Group on Disasters in Older Adults. People over 60 represented 15% of the New Orleans population, but 70% of those who died in Hurricane Katrina. Almost half of those killed by the devastating 2011 tornado in Joplin, Missouri, were older adults. And in New York City, 17.2% of the residents are over 60, but of the 40 people whose deaths were attributed to Hurricane Sandy, 37.5% were over 60. And they ranged, the, the, those killed by the hurricane, ranged in age from 62 to 91, and most of them drowned. In disasters, being old, frail, and unconnected can and does turn into a terminal condition. A quite functional 80-year-old who's able to care for herself, to get out, to shop, could be rendered suddenly disabled if a power failure left her stranded on the upper floor of her apartment building. According to the former head of the Hurricane Fund for the Elderly, what makes you at risk isn't that you're 75. Multiple chronic diseases, the need for prescription drugs, impaired mobility and cognition, problems like that make it harder, or in some cases impossible, to get out of danger quickly. About a third of older adults live alone and may not have anyone to help them in case of, their, of an emergency. And I can tell you time and again, evacuation is a disaster for that elderly person. As a society, we've neither imagined nor appreciated the long-term effects of experiencing a traumatic event, like a hurricane or an earthquake, or last week, the, the bo uh, bombing in Boston. We know that civilians can experience post-traumatic stress, yet we're not especially aggressive about making support available in part of the normal course of action after disaster, after man-made or natural disasters. Well, just as we've failed to imagine the scale and the scope, the extent of the effects of natural and man-made disasters, I think we've also failed to imagine the extent and reach of battlefield trauma, including traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress, not only on veterans, but also the impact on their families and their communities. And while there's much re research in progress, and, and I applaud what you as OTs are doing, there are so many unplanned for and unmet needs among both veterans and their families. Some new research discussed in a recent New York Times article by science writer David Dobbs suggests that PTSD runs higher among veterans who cannot reconnect with supportive people and new opportunities after they've come back from the battlefield. Dobbs asks, is the traumatic event more than just the event itself, the event plus some uh, crucial aspect of, so of the social environment has the potential to either dull or amplify the effects. And according to neuroscientist and writer Sandra Amat, author of Welcome to Your Brain, studies suggest there is no trauma to alleviate until the post-event social environment plays its role. This strengthens the argument, I think, for interventions, particularly social interventions, that have been shown to ease the effect of traumatic experiences. We can't undo the bad things that happen, but maybe we can reshape the environment that exists in its wake. As Dr. Amet puts it, the approach has, significant, has the significant advantage of being possible. This is an opportunity for all of us, OTs and the rest of our communities. Your professional website, Skills for the Job of Living, has, I think, some compelling words about OTs working throughout the community, counseling families, local governments, and community groups to ensure that each is doing what it can to help adults maintain their independence. Well, we've certainly failed to imagine the challenges of records management and claims for disability that needs to, need to be processed by the Defense Department and the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I debated in my mind about bringing this subject up today, but uh, as I 
did a little bit of research on uh, some recent figures that have come out of the Veterans Administration about the processing of disability claims. It occurred to me that it really does fit into the category of our failure to imagine and what the community then, working together, has in, in the way of an opportunity to provide additional support. Now let me describe the scale and scope of this particular tragedy. As of the most recent public report, there are 804,420 veterans claims being processed. So that's just all claims from the claim processed the day before the report, um, all, all claims in there. Out of those 800,000 plus claims, 570,000 are counted as being in the backlog. And the backlog is those claims that have been in process for more than 125 days. So half a million claims in the 125 plus day backlog. And of that half a million, all, almost half of those, 244,000 of the claims are more than one year old. The average claim takes 268 days to process with an average 318 day wait for veterans filing for the first time. So that means somebody you know in your community who turned 18, signed up for the armed forces, went off to serve our country, went to Afghanistan, Iraq, wherever, came back with a disability, an injury of some sort, um, traumatic brain injury, PTSD, whatever, goes through from the Defense Department through the VA system and truly is in limbo for an average, that first time claim, 318 days, the better part of a year. Their families are also in limbo. Their care is good or bad, kind of situationally dependent on their care. But they're out in all of our communities and they need all the support that we can give them. And I'll tell you from my perspective, when the Secretary of Veterans Affairs says that they're gonna fix the problem by 2015, I have to ask the question, is that good enough? I don't think it is good enough. It may be the best that they can do. But what I think it does compel us, all of us, is to think about how in our respective roles in our particular situations that we might be able to help that veteran and his or her family as they go through this uh, very lengthy process. So, um, and, and I would also say that there's certainly the potential to amplify the negative effect of what they had experienced in the armed forces. So the question, how can we do this better? And that's why I agreed to come here today, is to ask the question of all of you and to see if we can get a dialogue going about what the opportunities are here. Now, Mary was very persuasive, but I can also tell you that uh, I never miss a chance for an audience to share with you what I think is a call to action and ask you to become part of the solution. I, uh, I think it's great if any of you are volunteering uh, already for the Red Cross or any of the other organizations, and I would encourage you to do that. But I think there is so much more that can uh, be done. There's an opportunity for OT professionals to be a, a real uh, leader in communities and make the case that there are opportunities to do better. I think there's also, in your own individual interactions with patients, with your clients, there's an opportunity on a one-on-one on -one basis um, to change the course of someone's experience, future experience. Uh, and so I ask you, have you asked a client or a client's family if they have a personal disaster plan? If they have a really workable disaster plan? Have you reviewed it? Have you made it better? Help them make it better. Have you facilitated a liaison with another agency to make sure that the client's potential needs in a disaster are really going to be addressed? And this is particularly important for the independent living senior citizens 
who uh, can become uh, disaster victims a lot more easily than um, many other people. Do you see yourself as a player even in the realm of disaster preparedness and in the, the realm of assisting our veterans? I hope you do. Another opportunity uh, I saw in coming here today was to encourage more collaboration among the various segments of the OT profession. I'm impressed and, and honored by the number of military OTs who are participating in the conference. And I hope that there is much cross-communication um, among all of them, among the academics, among those of you who are out in clinics, who are in various settings with our military OTs. Let me ask a question. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you are sitting with, with your friends today? Probably, well, okay, a lot of you. How many of you are sitting with somebody you've never met before today? Okay, good. So I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> that, that bugs me at conferences. You, everybody comes together allegedly to share ideas, and then people sit as a, as a work group together. So please uh, carry on the tradition of this breakfast that you don't sit with all the people that you work with back home. I think that's great. Uh, make, make some new friends, and most importantly, exchange email addresses or figure out how you can share ideas across uh, social media. I think that's, that's terrific. And I hope that those of you who have the opportunity to meet and inter interact with the military OTs, that uh, you can uh, plot some ways to uh, improve the handoff from the military system into civilian communities, because I think that's another fabulous opportunity. So I think that that's my main message to you, is, is engage and get involved. And I was, uh, just about two weeks ago, I was at a, an event where I heard someone else speak, and he provided such a fabulous metaphor that I'm gonna pass it on. And I, I think, what is it, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Well, I hope he would be flattered to know that I'm passing on his idea about cathedral thinking. This is Jim Rogers, who's the uh, CEO and chairman of Duke Energy. What he referred to was people looking back the way that cathedrals were built in the Middle Ages. Those who envisioned just what Notre Dame or Chartres Cathedral would look like when they were completed made plans that they knew they were never gonna be around to see the, the finished um, edifice. Early workers on cathedrals worked towards a common purpose of building something lasting and seeming and strikingly beautiful and were contributing to a vision of the future. But once again, those early workers who laid the foundation, did, did the early work on that cathedral, were likely not to see that vision come to fruition. Instead, the planners and early builders of those magnificent buildings looked far ahead knowing they were building something amazing and also being aware that creating these buildings would take several generations of work. I urge you to apply cathedral thinking as together we try to imagine better, do a better job of imagining, and then tackle the most unimaginable problems. It is the same foundation of far-reaching vision, a well-thought-out blueprint and shared commission, co commitment to the long-term implementation. And in Jim Rogers' words, human beings are fantastic in their ability to dream, to plan ahead and look to the future. Think of Leonardo da Vinci conceptualizing the idea of humans being able to fly 400 years before the Wright brothers. Yet we often get mired in the small details of today that keep us from the big ideas and keep us from reaching the ideas that we want. We settle for what is and think we cannot change the future. Cathedral thinking flies in the face of all those small distractions of today and posits that we can indeed dream big and by our small actions today, we can advance ourselves towards goals and achievements. So I challenge you to work together to create a vision of a different future. The first step is to use your imagine to, uh, imagination to embrace the full scope of today's and tomorrow's problems, and then go to work building your community's cathedral and I wish you much success in doing that because I think we all have a stake in the successful outcome of your work. 
So thank you so much for inviting me here today, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Marty. Um, I, uh, we have three microphones set up, and I hope to see lines behind them very quickly. But um, uh, Marty, uh, unfortunately, had to listen to me harangue her a bit about this in terms of the possibilities <laughs> of this imagination uh, for our profession. And um, I think the, the, the foundation was a major driver in putting forth the first position paper we had on emergency and disaster preparedness, and it was a couple years after 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we've been quietly doing our work. We've had some exceptional leaders out in the community. We don't know how many of you are, are leaders who have de developed curriculums or anything else with this to give OTs the skills to ask these questions of their clients and to find the resources in the community that will help them. So I'm hoping that some of you will come to the microphone and either ask a question or tell us some of your experiences. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, my name is Melissa Matthew, and I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm an OTA student, and coming to the end of my first year as a student um, in this profession. And I just have a question about um, how to educate my generation about PTSD. Um, as you know, there's a very big divide in our country over war and what war is and mm -hmm. should, you, should we have gone in or should we not have? And people are forgetting that whether we went in or not, people are coming back and they're disabled and they don't have anywhere to go. They've lost everything that they thought they had. And I just was wondering if you had any answers on how to educate my generation on opening their mind to helping those that served our country, that are coming back from a war that maybe people don't think exists or something. Um, I feel in Maryland, there's a very big divide where I, where I live. and. Um, people get angry when you bring up the war and they get frustrated and I just don't know how to educate people on helping. Thank you. Well, that's, um, I think that's a profound question, frankly. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my first thought causes me to reflect on um, what it was like after the Vietnam War. Uh, where I think, and maybe this is the advantage of age, you see, you see, you see relative things. Um, but after the Vietnam War, not only did we not talk about the war, not only did we not um, accept the fact or appreciate the fact that uh, veterans who had served, particularly in theater, were suffering from unimaginable um, challenges. We didn't even have labels in those days for uh, the full dimension of the uh, psychological uh, situation, the trauma. Uh, so I think from one perspective, the perspective of a senior citizen, um, it, it is better because I think today, uh, in many segments of the population, uh, there is a, a, a sort of a division between the, your view on whether the wars were uh, enterprises we should have engaged in or not, and, and the military. I mean, today the military, I think, is, is uh, honored and respected and, and, the, and the troops are supported in a way that certainly we didn't see in the past. But I think you, you raise a very, very important question, uh, and that is, is it enough to just honor the troops? I mean, yesterday when I was in the airport in um, Fort Lauderdale, I needed, uh, I needed just a little tube of toothpaste and the saleswoman um, said, uh, oh, well, will you, will you make a donation to the troops, uh, like that toothpaste that you're buying? And I thought, you know, that's really nice. But then I thought, no, wait a minute, you don't get off that easy. You don't get off just by giving a little donation of a tube of toothpaste when the problems are so much greater. Um, I, think, I think that um, 
we change attitudes kind of one person at a time. And I think that no amount of um, outreach or speaking that you do, um, small groups, small campus events, that sort of thing, um, to raise the issues and have a, a hopefully a, an open dialogue, have that possibility, um, th that's all worthwhile activities. I think that um, people who write um, op-ed pieces for um, the newspapers, or uh, that's how old school I am, I read newspapers still, people who put on social media um, make a persuasive case. I think that reaches people as well. Um, but I think it is a community education um, need that is clearly unmet. And I think that is one way is to try to make inroads in that kind of small group. Um, one other point about P PTSD comes to mind. Uh, as Mary mentioned, I was in the San Francisco earthquake. And um, what was very interesting to me was, and this is what, 1989, we didn't know that civilians in a traumatic uh, experience like that, and it was, my house was the closest house to the um, exit from the Bay Bridge, the, the bridge that fell down, uh, so it was pretty, it was pretty close to home uh, for us, uh, living on uh, Treasure Island and Yerba Buena Island. We didn't know that people experienced that there was post-traumatic stress in natural disasters. That was a whole part of uh, psychological intervention that, didn't, that never occurred for those of us in that um, because we didn't know that you could, I, I'm not even sure in those days we knew that it came from the battlefield either, but, but we certainly didn't appreciate that um, uh, it was a, an experience, a, a result, a condition that uh, could uh, be, be a product of an experience of a natural disaster. And so I'm thinking that Maybe what's missing is a broader education of the community about the, the whole experience of traumatic events. Battlefield trauma is one, but also natural disaster related, or, or now in Boston, I'm absolutely confident there are people with, uh, po who will have post-traumatic stress. Uh, from that experience. So, you know, maybe that's another avenue is, is the broader education of the public about what it is and then the manifestations uh, through the different experiences and that's maybe a way to take out the politics, if you will, of, um, of, of the, the war-related piece of it. Yes, I, I think as occupational therapists, uh, compassion is, and empathy is what we're all about. It's part of our code of ethics. And to sit through and decide whether or not someone is worthy of our attention is, is probably um, a very mean-spirited attitude, and I, I personally don't know many OTs that do that. But it is a problem. It was a problem in Vietnam. I married a military fighter pilot and I lost two OT friends because I had joined the enemy. Now, now tell me that makes sense. And these were OTs. So it's a very political issue, and what you want to do is sort of turn the fire down on that and, and look at the human being there and their family that needs help. Uh, Colonel, you've uh, been that back there standing up. Uh, Frank Pascarelli from the Centers for Disease Control. Well, Admiral, thank you first for your service to this country in uniform and your continued service out of, out of uniform. We really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate in my role wearing a uniform to got, have deployed downrange internationally and domestically. And in my role as CDC, I can plop in and out when the director says you need to go to do this. But for those OTs that are not in uniform or in my role like in CDC, emergency managers and state health officers are craving behavioral health intervention. And there's been a problem for occupational therapists to get recognized by the American Red Cross as behavioral health providers, as well as in the NDMS system, National Disaster Medical System, which is sponsored by HHS. What recommendations or strategies can you put forth to the membership here today and leadership to help get into the Red Cross as a recognized behavioral health provider and or with NDMS? Good point. Good. That's a great question. Uh, I, I, 
first of all, let me, let me apologize for any pushback during the time I was at Red Cross. Um, <laughs> I, I will tell anybody who's been in a volunteer-based organization, I mean, you know that there's um, a high incidence of the not invented here syndrome and all kinds of reasons. Uh, but what I, what I think needs to be done is a, I don't want to say a, a strategic plan. Uh, and we talked briefly about this before, uh, before breakfast. Um, I think that, you know, the Red Cross looks to the Centers for Disease Control, HHS, and FEMA for direction. I mean, the Red Cross does not draft the National Response Plan. That is a federal plan. And so one of the first things that, that I would look carefully at is how to um, winnow into the process of drafting the National Response Plan. Uh, I think the, the friends in court that OTs have, and I really encourage you to take this one on, uh, you have Craig Fugate, the head of FEMA, who is, used to be the Florida uh, head of, uh, of uh, disaster management, I think an eminently reasonable guy. So I think that, that one of the things you need to do is, is target specific individuals to make the case. And it has to be multi-front. So, the head of FEMA would be a really important person. Um, the Surgeon General, and I don't know the state, uh, is, it's Regina Benjamin, Regina I think Benjamin. now. Is it, yeah. yeah. Uh, who has lived through herself, she has lived through disaster. So I would think that she would be another strategic uh, target for uh, uh, making the case. Um, and she comes from uh, Louisiana, I believe it is, or Mississippi, the Gulf Coast. So she, she knows that business and knows what the community needs are. Uh, I think that um, your state, every state now has a much more highly developed emergency response manager. And it's, every state does it differently. Every state has a different way that it's uh, integrated into state government, sometimes directly through the governor's office and sometimes through other, uh, other means. So I think every state represents an opportunity because as the federal plan is, is shaped, then the state plans, the local plans. And so I think you have to get to the, um, the leadership of the, the planning, um, but I think it starts with, uh, with, with targeting that. And then the other area, I think you have to work Capitol Hill. I think you have to work the key committees that um, get involved in, I can tell you from my experience, there probably were 20, key com 20 committees that thought they were key uh, when, <laughs> when disasters happen. So again, I think you've got to kind of look at the landscape on Capitol Hill and figure out uh, where some opportunities to, to influence that. I think it has to be a strategic plan. It has to be a very systematic plan. I think your professional association has a real opportunity to, to push it. Um, and then, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, it also is at the local community level too because they're the ones when the disaster happens, uh, they're looking around for who's responding here. Um, so I think that's, that's another piece of it. Um, when, when I was at Red Cross, as soon as we had a, a national response, for you know, any, any kind of disaster of, of any size. We also had a public health augmentation in our, um, in our uh, response center, National Response Center. Uh, and so I think that's, that's another opportunity and that through the Surgeon General or uh, other, some other subset of the public health service. And I think that's the CDC's connection. So I think it starts, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like the Red Cross, you know, five point is make a plan <laughs> and uh, you know, put together a little kit, make a consistent case, speak with one voice, uh, and, and be very persuasive, and then don't give up. Thank you. Sue. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you very much for this inspiring talk and also for your service. I'd like to um, ask you to take us even further down the road of vision. In the United States, we're facing disasters in, at an unprecedented rate, and we're now in a country which has so many 
people who've sacrificed their health and well-being to serve our country. Uh, and what I'd like to hear about is your vision for a more global approach to how we care for people who have um, served and how we deal with disaster because so much is globalized in this world uh, that I, I sort of see that uh, the need to, for us to go beyond our borders in terms of creating this kind of care, compassion, and vision that you're describing. That, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, She's our World Federation delegate oh. from the United States. <laughs> You know, one of the things we learned in 9-11 is that, uh, you know, up, to, up until 9-11, I think it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that, uh, from the perspective of the American Red Cross at least, that we sent aid outward. We, the American Red Cross operated in maybe 35 countries at any one time. Uh, sending aid outward for all kinds of projects, whether it's uh, immediate disaster response, it's um, disaster mitigation, in the case of the measles vaccination campaign, actually vaccinating uh, country by country, uh, 95 plus percent of the children during 10 day periods. So, so we were used to just kind of sending it out and, and we had sort of prepackaged, we had an idea of what they needed and we would send it out. 9-11 was a real turning point because we received aid from many different countries. Uh, <laughs> I will tell you one, one uh, issue, and this came up again in Katrina, apparently the disaster meals in, from one country in Europe included a small bottle of wine. <laughs> and people were horrified because American disaster meals did not include anything like wine. Uh, but, uh, but that was a real cultural difference. <laughs> and, um, but, but, but it brought home to us the fact that um, it, it's really important to um, have a shared sense of what um, human needs are and then how we can partner. So I, I think it, it relates to um, a, a global view about um, people's right to care, to be cared for and supported by their community, uh, to be, uh, to have interventions that will help prevent disease um, and other, you know, the human condition. And I think, you know, that happens to some extent through things like the UN system, um, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, which is a 180 plus uh, global network. Um, and what I think needs to happen more, it happens to some limited extent, but for worldwide professional organizations where there are, um, there is a, a network to, um, to have those partnerships. And I, I think to some extent the UN promotes that. There are different activities under some of the UN councils that, um, that do that. Um, so I think that's important. But I think what, what else is important is for individuals in our communities to have a, an opportunity to see other situations. So um, young people growing up, to have that experience where they, uh, through a church uh, youth group or a Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, through some kind of professional experience and other, other nonprofits and NGOs, to have an experience that takes them out of their local community, out of their own country, uh, and uh, takes them beyond the borders um, to, to make that connection. Um, there's an organization, for example, called Seeds of Peace that actually bring Palestinian and Israeli young people together in, uh, I believe it's New Hampshire, um, for uh, a very uh, well-constructed dialogue. I think that's, I think every young person, you know, if I were queen of the world, every young person would have that opportunity. At the military academies now, I think it's very important, um, a very high percentage of midshipmen, cadets, um, going through the service academies, get that experience. It's privately funded. 
but they have the experience of, of going abroad and um, whether it's for a summer or an academic year. I think we need to do more of that to create among the next generation that sense that they're part of something larger than themselves and oh, by the way, it happens to be the world. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi there. Um, I'm over here. Penny. Yes. Uh, I'm another public health person, and um, just as an FYI, currently there are about 75 occupational therapists in the Public Health Service Corps, including one in the Office of Assistant Secretary of Health for Disaster Preparedness. So we are making little inroads. But I was really struck by the statistics you quoted about the older population and the lack of preparedness within that particular population. Mm -hmm. And wondered a couple of things. One, um, do you have any reports or something that you could point us to that would bolster our argument? And two, um, do you know any other types of organizations that we should try to engage with to move the agenda forward to help that population. As an example, I've gone to the American Public Health Association meeting regularly and have gone into the uh, geriatric section and lo and behold, there are never any OTs in that particular section. Um, they have really talked extensively about the issues regarding mobility and community engagement and if you know the um, old Office on Aging, or Administration of Aging, has changed its name to the Administration on Community Living with a focus on keeping people in the community. But I really would like to know if there are other places that we really should try to engage. Yeah. You know, when you were asking the question, I, w I was struck by, uh, I guess, memories of my experience in the Navy um, came flooding back. Uh, it, it is fabulous that an OT is now in a, a high-level office, but I will tell you it's also, my guess, is a huge challenge because a person who goes into an, a setting where they're the first and only and they're sent there, the opportunity to go there comes from somebody in higher authority perceiving a need, but I tell you it's tough work because You've got to fit in, you want to fit in, you want to be a good colleague. You can't go in and start breaking China the first day. Um, so you, you've got to, it, it's, it's a delicate road and, and I would encourage you to provide real support, you know, friends and, and, and uh, make sure that person knows they're really supported because they probably have got to change, they've got to be an agent of change. And, and that's some of the hardest work I think that people are called on to do when things need to be changed. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the huge problem is uh, community by community. You know, every community is, should have some really discreet disaster planning done. And my experience, there's a tendency to say, well, how many disabled in the community? Well, you know, those are people already identified. They're, you know, certified, everybody knows, and, you know, they're, they're great plans. I mean, important planning is done to make sure that they're taken care of. It's the people that fall through the cracks. And that's why I think um, while, you know, some people want to be hands-on delivering the service, it's really important to be at the planning table because at that point you can raise the question of, well, wait a minute, what about people that will become disabled, that, that big group that are mobile now and self-sufficient but absolutely need help? And um, it's, um, it's, it's a, I think it's a too slow a process, uh, but it has to be done neighborhood by neighborhood, community by community, you know, down to almost a neighborhood watch kind of a, a, a situation. And, and that's a question, you know, is, what is the neighborhood watch? Uh, is it operative? Some communities I've lived in have great neighborhood watch organizations. I mean, it's almost scary they watch too much. Uh, <laughs> but they can be very, very helpful in uh, making sure everybody's accounted for and supported. And, and the analysis is done 
to make sure that you know what kind of support the person. It, it's, it's risk assessment is really what it is, risk management. Um, I can, after the, the speech, I can give you the name of the woman that uh, I cited in the, um, Lisa Brown, that I cited in the, uh, from the New York Times article about uh, the uh, transition in a disaster from self-sufficiency to being uh, substantially disabled by the disaster. Yeah, that's a profound. We have about uh, four or five minutes here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Carolyn, you've been standing there very patiently. Dr. Baum. Thank you, Marty, for your leadership and your service and for your challenges. Um, I wanted to share with you all something that I think we can do um, if there are educators in the group. Um, we had our occupational therapy students be briefed by the Area Agency on Aging and the Office of Disability in St. Louis, and they formed teams with their staff, with our students, to build the structure behind the disaster plans for the city, for the aging, and for the disabled. And I think it's a really good way to introduce the students, because nobody left not knowing that they had to plan disaster plans with their patients and with their families and with their community groups because that's where people get socialized to what roles are and um, they all came back, the staff from those agencies came back to hear the students' presentations and took their portfolios of development ideas with them to implement and I think that Things like that can just make an easy difference. Great ideas. Can That's I a great model. Um, yes, very good. A quick question. Very, very quickly. I'm a first year student at the University of Southern California, and I've had the fortune. Can you speak up, please? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have the experience to do 11 1 field work with an amazing OT in home health, and I sort of have a question to pose to the room about how can we establish a better mentorship structure to introduce students, but also support clinicians in home health, because you have a lot of single OTs driving from house to house, and it's very difficult to get collaboration, and I've watched my fieldwork instructor, who's great, he's an amazing OT, but he struggles as the owner of a home health agency to find occupational therapists and to find good occupational therapists. He ha like, there's just no support structure to really help develop good home health OTs, and that's what, like, for an assignment, literally, last month, I had one of my goals was to establish an an evacuation plan for an older woman with several chronic diseases. Thank you for your insights there. And uh, I think we're getting an agenda together here. I think I'll take one last question from Madam Vice President of the World, Sue Baptiste. <laughs> Just Whoa, okay, um, I'm, I'm interested, I've been set, sitting there listening to s this morning and I've been putting it together with experiences I've had of late and I'm beginning to wonder if part of the lack of ability to integrate and as assume these values is language. Um, in Canada people say, well, <laughs> What is disaster preparedness for anyway? Of course, if you, you have a tsunami, that's awful, you know, and, and, and all of these. And so we have a few fires, but, and I'm being a bit glib, but not much. And um, it concerns me because I think maybe language in a more universal way related to supporting vigilance and creating resilience is what we're looking for. And, and I, I'd love to see a, a, a cross-cultural collaboration about a project of that nature that could actually be integrated into a, the core practice of occupational therapy. Um, because I think there is a lot of the human condition based in those words, as opposed to disaster preparedness. That's the preamble Absolutely. to the strategic plan. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Yes. Oh. One a last remark that I would make is that I've actually scoured our documents to find out how we relate to emergency situations and families and clients and disasters. And kids, 
nobody can know us that we have the capabilities for that by the way we talk, the language issue that she is mentioning in our uh, curriculum designs, in our ACOAT requirements, it's not in our practice framework in a very solid way. How can we market ourselves as the people who do this, even though we know how to do it, you know, um, it's not in our documentation. So to me, that's a major challenge for the association. And I'm gonna leave the last word here to the Admiral. I wish you all the best of success. What you do every day is so important, but what's even more important is what I hope you're going to do. As a profession, I think it's very exciting to think about a, a strategy to move, move this forward in a way that uh, really capitalizes on the amazing network that you have, the worldwide network, um, and, and move this forward. Um, I think many of us don't appreciate the fact that someday sooner rather than later, perhaps, we are going to be the beneficiaries of what you all do today. So uh, more than just my, my little gamekeeper's thumb, but, uh, but uh, this is serious business. And um, we don't know when it's going to happen, you know, when the next disaster is going to happen. It is going to happen. Um, but uh, we can't waste any time. Uh, it's, it's time to get better prepared than we are today. So thank you all very much. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Well, thank you.